Unlike much of the world, however, this is a region that's no stranger to challenges. We have a distinguished panel here to discuss the future of the region, joining us from, I think, I hope I'm getting this right, Astana, Tashkent, Yerevan, and Washington. Um, first of all, we're going to start with some opening remarks from Barjan Bektimirov, the chief economist of the Astana International Financial Center. And then we'll go into a panel discussion. Uh, our panelists are Jihad Azur, the director of Middle East and Central Asia Department at the IMF, uh, Martin Galstian, the chairman of the Central Bank of Armenia, Aziza uh, Umarova, the CEO of SmartGov Consulting. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, the event is being broadcast live. Uh, it's in English on the IMF's IMF Live channel and on YouTube, uh, also on the IMF's Facebook uh, page, and in Russian on the IMF's uh, Facebook Asia page. Uh, you can also follow it on social media with the hashtags uh, Central Asia and Caucasus. And just a reminder to everyone, if you're, if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, please stay muted. And this panel is on the record, and I think there are some journalists on the line, so be aware of that. There will be an opportunity to ask questions later on to all four of our speakers, so please do send them either on Zoom, if you're on Zoom, or via social media, uh, and I'll do my best to ask as many as possible. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to, to Barjan. Uh, Barjan, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, it's a big honor for me to talk here about uh, this very timely and important topic on coping with COVID-19 and with such a distinguished panel of speakers, of course. I believe that the dealing with this disease and its consequences, both at macro and micro level, is one of the most important priorities for governments and people across the globe. I think it's for everyone. The task of dealing with the disease is already a very complicated one, but policymakers, or for that matter, any decision maker, should be able to think in three different dimensions at the same time. So there's immediate policies, immediate decision to fight the virus and save people's life. And then there's uh, short-term policies to sustain the production of goods and services to keep the economy afloat. And then the medium to long-term policies to ensure steady recovery and sustainable growth in the future. Well, unfortunately, since everyone on the planet is still battling with the virus and there's a lot of internal policies to do so, which restrict travel and limit cooperation. So our immediate policies are Unfortunately, the burden of the respective governments, it's very hard to work hand in hand when we battle the, 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 the virus. But I strongly believe that we must find right policies to work together as countries in the region, CCA region, and multilateral developing institutions such as IMF or development banks to design the right short-term and medium-term policies to actually go out of crisis uh, in a steady way. So it, as pointed out in the excellent report, which was published recently by the IMF, the regional outlook, the region had rapid and strong crisis response, but it did require, of course, stepping deep into existing fiscal space um, for Kazakhstan, for sure. It was possible for us to, due to prudent fiscal policy in the previous years, we, you know, thankfully for our exporting uh, oil and gas, we have the national fund. And the response from the central authorities was very, very bold. We introduced tight measures to continue the spread. We increased fundings for important expansionary development policies, such as, for example, um, economy of simple things or employment roadmap. We built new hospitals, we helped the uh, uh, healthcare workers, and we even dispersed temporary benefits for those who suffered the most from the pandemic and lockdowns. We had this monthly uh, transfers. Then the central government and quasi-government sectors led uh, by the president's office and President Tukayev himself introduced a detailed comprehensive fiscal package, which equaled about 8.5% of GDP, which is um, in relative terms quite, quite uh, high. But although that I think that the this is important, I think even more important are the policies that are targeting longer term development. So as the regional outlook points, rightly points, I'm gonna quote, in the medium term, employment should be supported through encouraging competitive business friendly environment and policies that promote, promote labor mobility toward higher value added sectors. So this is important because this is um, something longer term. And it is also in line with our new economic course, which was announced by President Tokayev early last month on September 1st. Well, obviously, I don't have time to go over details, but some very important highlights of the course are inclusiveness, um, increasing productivity and complexity of our economy, uh, consistency of pro-growth policy and social agenda, which in, in, uh, in our thinking should be uh, closer to get together, we should go hand in hand. Greener economy, of course, and in the broader context, um, reliance on the ESG principles. And of course, modernization and digitalizations of existing business processes. And to design and implement these reforms, the head of state established a new agency for strategic planning and reforms, uh, which has very symbolic acronym, uh, ASPIRE, because it wants to aspire new changes to improve the efficiency of the reforms and the, um, the, how the government works. 
and the Supreme Council of the Reforms, chaired by President himself, with um, Sir Suma Chakrabarty, former President Fabiardi, at his deputy chairman. So the council has already commenced its work and now challenges all key decision makers in social economic agenda to deliver the outcome-driven reforms. And the idea is to rely on these modern institutions, on this modern process, um, one such institution, or rather the cluster of institutions, is the one I represent today, the Astana International Financial Center, which goal is to, uh, exactly to the point of regional outlook, to encourage business-friendly environment for businesses and investors in the region. So we want to support the development of the region, we want to promote cooperation, we want to help investors to de-risk their operations if they're investing in any country in Central Asia, Caucasus, or even Russia and Mongolia, because this is really regional development. And the processes which I already mentioned um, are challenging to be not just you know, reformed for the sake of the reform, but they should be impact and outcome oriented. So just as the COVID uh, impacted the whole economy and the lives of every citizen alike, we want the response to COVID, the, all the reforms and policies, to have tangible impact on every citizen of Kazakhstan. So to outdo what the disease and the lockdowns have done. And obviously, to, to hopefully, to have positive uh, spillovers, not only to Kazakhstan, but to regional neighbors. So I think that's the common goal. And I think that the two speakers also share this goal to some extent. And I'm looking forward to the exciting discussion of the topic. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bajan. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back uh, to Kazakhstan later on in the discussion. And, and I hope we'll have some questions for you as well. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, you can follow the conversation at uh, hashtag Central Asia and also hashtag Caucasus. Um, we're taking questions on social media, also in Russian. Um, so please do uh, think about what you'd like to ask the panelists. And uh, in a little while, we'll open the floor, or rather, I will ask the questions that you've sent in. Um, but now let's move on to uh, an open panel discussion um, with, our, with our panelists. Um, the countries of uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia region have taken swift and quite drastic measures to mitigate the spread of the virus, but that's come here in this region, like uh, in much of the world, at a steep economic cost. Um, the IMF is now estimating that five years from now, the region's economic output could be 11% below the output level uh, before um, coronavirus trends uh, took place. Um, for oil exporters, um, they're being affected by a sharp decline in oil income as the oil price has fallen very dramatically. Um, for oil importers, they're suffering um, from lower remittances and also uh, lower income from tourism. The region's also seeing its fair share of political unrest as recent events in Kyrgyzstan and in the Caucasus show. I'm going to open up with a question to Jihad Azur, uh, the director of the IMF's Middle East and Central Asia Department. Jihad, um, you've just prepared the IMF's uh, outlook for the region. Give us an overview of, of the situation in Central Asia and Caucasus. Um, how is the region doing and what do you think and how do you think policymakers should be responding? Thank you very much, Jack. And again, I would like to welcome uh, those who are on the panel and those who are uh, listening and participating later on through their questions. As it was said uh, uh, by both uh, you and Barjan, um, this re uh, region has been affected, like um, all parts of the world, by, uh, by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. But it was not the only shock that the region has faced, uh, being also an oil-dependent or oil uh, and gas producing region, uh, um, the volatility we saw in oil price was an additional shock to the first one. In addition to that, there is also a third one, uh, which is related to the connectivity. Uh, and um, many countries of the region are dependent on uh, their partners in terms of remittances, as well as also in terms of flow of trade and tourism. Therefore, it was a complicated, uh, and complex crisis that uh, countries were not prepared to uh, uh, to address it. But I would say, if uh, we look back for the last uh, seven, eight months, that the countries of the region uh, were able to uh, introduce the right measures to uh, address the multiplicity of shocks. Of course, in the beginning, the focus was on protecting lives. And uh, we saw that uh, measures were introduced in terms of social distancing uh, and other type of measures that in terms of stringency were among the highest worldwide. And this is, has paid because it saved life. And when we compare 
the level of spreading of the virus uh, compared to other parts of the world, we see that countries were able to uh, address this issue fairly successfully. The second thing is this crisis had an impact on the economy. Many of the countries of the region have already faced in 2014, 2015, a previous shock. And I would say they have learned the lessons. Uh, and how we see that, we see this because of the uh, variety of instruments that were used uh, uh, in terms of uh, addressing the shock. Fiscal instrument was put to play in order to protect lives and livelihoods. Financial and monetary instruments in order to stabilize the economy. We saw several countries using monetary instrument exchange rate in order to reduce the impact of an exogenous shock on their internal economy. And also we saw um, uh, both uh, uh, the fiscal and uh, central bank measures in order to provide and protect uh, uh, sectors from, uh, from deep uh, recession and scarring. And various measures were introduced uh, in order to provide on one hand liquidity and on the other hand to ease the pressure on the balance sheet of the private sector. Of course, this came at a time where the level of uncertainty remained and was high. Uh, and this, uh, compared to other parts of the world, if we compare the magnitude of the measures, I would say we are in line with other uh, parts of the world. Of course, countries who have buffers, like Kazakhstan, like Azerbaijan, were able to uh, provide more. Others who have already uh, uh, been used to managing shocks, uh, uh, used a, multi a multitude uh, of, of instruments for that, uh, combining both uh, uh, monetary and uh, fiscal measures. Where do we stand now? I would say uh, we are in a year where growth uh, going to be negative in most of the countries, except a few like, uh, uh, um, uh, like uh, Uzbekistan, like uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Uh, but the the large part of the region will, uh, 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 will witness this year negative growth. Of course, the impact on growth uh, will be felt more in the oil importing countries, and this shows that uh, uh, the linkages of those countries to, uh, to their partner is high. Uh, we, are, uh, we are witnessing also a higher impact on countries where service sectors are high, like tourism, like trade, but, and also we are witnessing uh, compared to other parts of the world, that uh, 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 the capacity to rebound uh, uh, in the medium term needs some additional and careful measures. Otherwise, we could wait for some time to regain the level of growth uh, that the region enjoyed prior to the, prior to the crisis. What also uh, the last seven months showed us are a certain number of weaknesses and I would say potential. On the, weaknessing, on the weaknesses side, um, the high level of informality is an issue that limited the impact of any uh, uh, measure on the social side and on the support of uh, uh, livelihood and income of people. The second uh, weakness is a um, certain number of sectors were more affected than others, especially in countries where, uh, for example, tourism is, uh, is an important sector. And this requires some vertical policies in order to address and help those sectors, but also countries who are dependent on remittances, like, like for example, Kyrgyz Republic. On, I would say on the bright side, we saw an agility in uh, adjusting and adapting to the crisis and developing a certain number of instruments and measures that uh, help those countries cope and recover fast. And uh, here technology will be one of the important area for, uh, I would say, potential growth. This is one of the silver linings. The second element is the, the strengths of the financial system. Um, the measures and reforms that were introduced post-2015 are paying there um, now, um, well, uh, because the financial system is protected. And any impact, and we did a stress test this year in our report, that shows that the capacity of those countries um, to absorb and amortize any shock uh, is relatively uh, benign compared to other parts of the world. My last point is um, on the issue of uh, um, where do we stand today and what is coming next? Of course, the level of uncertainty is high <clears throat> because the risk of a second wave is 
is, um, is there. We see it in Europe, we see it in other parts of the world, which means that priorities are still uh, first to make sure that we have enough emissions to address any healthcare issue that could emerge. And this would require from all countries to find resources uh, to finance that. The second thing is uh, in terms of financing. When you look at the region, especially the oil importing ones, uh, a large part of their financing came from IFIs and MDBs. And I think it's very important for both we as institutions and those countries to think together, what are the challenges in terms of financing in, in 2021 and how we can uh, achieve um, the financing uh, needs uh, for them next year. Uh, countries also need to maintain, uh, I would say, the right balance uh, in terms of how to protect sectors that uh, uh, need to recover uh, uh, and also how to address sectors that will have difficulties to recover too. And um, I would encourage everyone to go to the chapter that we have on economic scarring that shows a bit the directions that we can go in more details uh, later on. Three is uh, we need to recover fast because inclusion has eroded in the past. Uh, and the social system uh, that proved to be an important anchor in managing uh, this type of uh, multi-shock uh, crisis need to be restored and repaired. And this would require um, some uh, policy transformation, uh, both on the social protection side and uh, providing, I would say, uh, a um, wide range of, of uh, social insurance, social protection, but also reducing inequality. And this would require to also address the tax system and address the inclusion issues. Also, the economy has to start uh, the transformation to give uh, a greater potential uh, for a rebound. And reforming SOEs is one area that has been started in the past, but uh, would need to be strengthened. Last but not the least, I think citizens' confidence in state require to strengthen governance and um, address any issues that have to do with corruption or other um, misutilization of resources. And I think this is going to be also an area of importance because uh, the confidence of citizen in state proved to be critical uh, during, uh, during uh, uh, the last uh, the last uh, seven, eight months, and also the confidence in the state to help in the recovery, invest in technology, in greening the recovery, will also be very, very important. It's a fascinating moment, um, and a moment where uh, I think the importance of policy is crucial. We are in one of those moments where policymakers have a great responsibility. And I'm happy to have Martin here uh, with us uh, who, uh, and with his colleagues in Armenia, were able to uh, manage also a multitude of shops. Uh, and I think this is where the priority is, and this is where we at the fund, in addition to the financial support that we're providing, we are very much in contact with our, with our authorities in order to make sure that on the policy side, they can benefit from what we have developed with our policy tracker, but also how we uh, cater for their needs because policies matter today uh, and they can make a big difference. I can stop here maybe, um, uh, Jack, and then we can go over some of the issues later on in the discussion. That's great, thank you, yes. Uh, that was a very uh, good overview of the situation and also lots of the challenges that uh, both this region and most of the world faces in the coming months and years. Uh, let's turn now to, to Martin, uh, Martin Galstian, the chairman of the Central Bank of Armenia. Martin, perhaps you can, um, you can give us an overview of, of how you and Armenia have been approaching the crisis um, from a monetary policy set part, point of view and also uh, the government overall. Um, and, and, and how do you weigh up the balance between uh, an accommodative monetary policy stance and um, maintaining financial stability? Thanks, Jack. Uh, <clears throat> first, let me thank the IMF and Jihad personally for organizing this event and inviting me as a panelist. Um, I'll make actually two points. First, I'll talk about the monetary policy response to the pandemic shock. And secondly, on the interaction between price and financial stability because of high level of dollarization. 
<clears throat> my analysis is mainly based on Armenian experience, but after reading the report on regional economic outlook, I believe can be generalized for emerging markets as well. So I think there are several lessons that could be drawn from, from what I speak about. First, um, in, in the developing countries, the pro-cyclicality of monetary policy has always been a norm. The standard story is that global shocks usually trigger capital outflow and currency depreciation, pressures limiting the space for monetary policy. However, during this pandemic episode, it was different. Most emerging central banks, including the Central Bank of Armenia, were able to ease monetary policy at the peak of the shock while allowing exchange rate to depreciate. I can suggest several factors that contributed to this. Namely, the first would be concentrated easing of financial conditions in advanced economies. Second would be robust banking sector and favorable macroprudential conditions, as Jihad mentioned. We were very much prepared for this crisis after the lessons that we have learned during 2014, 2015 one. Well anchored inflation expectations would be the next one. In some countries, as a result of committed disinflationary policies of previous years and low inflation environment in general, the global, after the global financial crisis, we were able to waive the shocks much more easily. Indeed, in our case, since 2014 crisis, oil crisis, when our inflation expectations ratcheted up, we conducted disinflationary policy to re-anchor the expectations. To do so, we kept inflation lower than the target for quite some time and clearly communicated, and I want to stress the word communication, that the purpose of this strategy is to minimize the costs of prudent policy during bad times. We were criticized a lot for this, but as the pandemic crisis showed, this clearly paid off. As I mentioned before, despite the huge uncertainty, inflation expectations remained anchored and we were able to ease monetary policy and the rate at the peak of the crisis. Having said this, the main question is if emerging markets have graduated from pro-cyclicality regime. In other words, do emerging markets enjoy high levels of credibility and are better anchored than before. Based on our country's or my country's experience, the preliminary answer is cautiously optimistic. Looking forward, there is no alternative to seriously working on the institutional improvements of monetary policy regimes, leading to increased credibility and lower dollarization. In the meantime, the role of macroprudential measures and regulations should be to enforce the containment of possible foreign exchange risks with particular stress on foreign exchange liquidity. This is very important. However, it is evident that the pandemic crisis has beyond trivial effects on income distribution, both for households and firms. This environment is naturally conducive to heroism bias for emerging market central banks whereby the central banks are inclined to do too much heavy lifting in the medium term, despite the fact that the fiscal policy should be the first line of defense. Indeed, coping, copying that advanced countries are doing may not be the way out because the distributional problems are structural. For example, the pandemic clearly showed the importance of well-functioning social safety nets in many developing countries, the issue of helping people was not availability of funds, but the social security infrastructure. In terms of financial dollarization and the financial stability risks associated with it because of the monetary policy easing after the pandemic shock, I do not see any fundamental dilemma here. I believe that achieving macro stability meaning anchored inflation expectations and making sure that banks are well capitalized and well regulated weakens, if not eliminates, possible trade-offs between these two goals. The main risk of financial stability after the pandemic stem from the sharp drop in income and the possible deleveraging because of uncertainty. The easing of monetary policy positively contributes to both of this. 
and the easing of macroprudential regulation contributes positively to growth and inflation. Of course, in the transition period, the risk of financial stability should be carefully managed, and the prudential regulations stressing foreign exchange liquidity and credit risks are the key. But this is true at all times. Probably I'll stop here, and if there are any other questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take those. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, just, just one follow-up question uh, from me. Um, we see around the world uh, that inflation is um, is a key concern uh, of markets, um, probably less so of central banks, I think, right now. But there's certainly a view around the world that um, as it, when eventually we get into an, an economic recovery, whenever that might happen, um, mm. that that we could really see inflation take off, given all of the money that has been uh, pushed into the in, into markets and into into economies. Uh, as a result of measures to control COVID. How do you assess that risk from your point of view in Armenia? Is that something you're concerned about? And, and, and how would you address it? So thank you for that question. Uh, Armenia started uh, to be an inflation targeting country from 2006. And starting from that point on, our main goal was um, to get the trust of our people and to anchor the inflation expectations. The crisis happened, the oil crisis happened in 2014, 2015. And after that crisis, we considerably redesigned our policy in terms of trying to get that trust back. And we were very, um, uh, very proactive in, in that stance. What we did, we deliberately decided that inflation should be a bit lower than our target is. So it was deliberately done to pursue our uh, general public that central banks stands where the promise is. And then we made clear to them that we want their inflation expectation to be somehow lower than the not bringing inflation to the target for, for at least a couple of years. But the decision was made with clear understanding that there are forthcoming shocks. Obviously, we didn't know that the shock will be in terms of COVID or something like that at that scale. But what we had in mind is that anticipation of something else would come a bit later. And we were right in assuming so. And then uh, we think that it absolutely paid off for us we were able to decrease the interest rate by more than 100 basis points at the peak of the crisis. And that even at this point, we, didn't, we don't see any problem with managing the inflation in Armenia. So one thing, uh, just for everybody else, I think that could be interesting, is that you should keep your promises and not to be inclined to go under political pressures during even the good times. So you should follow your uh, road and make what you promised before. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to Aziza now. Um, uh, Jihad mentioned earlier already the importance of uh, strengthening governance um, for the region. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what's been happening in Uzbekistan, um, which has made pretty extraordinary moves on governance over the past couple of years. Um, and, and also, uh, more generally in the region, do you think now is an easy moment to push through reforms of governance? It, it, it strikes me that in the midst of this kind of situation where you have some really extraordinary uh, challenges that governments face, it may, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult moment to, to start reforming governance, but maybe it's exactly the right moment to be doing it. Uh, what do you think and how should, uh, how should governments in the region be approaching this? Thank you very much for this question, and I'm very delighted to be here today uh, with this panel. Um, in general, about Uzbekistan, many things have been already said uh, in the last three, four years, and I think country is, is making some uh, very good steps in the right directions, including in the area of governance. It's not easy, but it's 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 done. So I'm very excited to see um, the beginning of the civil service reform. We also have unfolding administrative reform. Um, there is a more and more um, international experience that finally is being tapped on 
when we do structural um, um, changes and transformations in the sectors. Um, later, I'll talk a bit more about SOEs, but right now I would like to say that in general, I think Uzbekistan was trying to quickly catch up with the rest of the region in terms of um, public administration reform, and it seems to be uh, very timely. But I also would like to say that in general, I think what we've seen as a challenge during the coronavirus um, pandemic in the region was that the way of decision-making works in the region is slightly different from what actually I think would be fit for purpose right now. In, in the West and in the East, there is very uh, popular foresighting as part of the decision-making. So whenever policymakers are um, developing or designing new options, they would look at the futures. Not the future, but the future. So you have usually as part of the government's structures, practitioners sitting can do it for citing, or you work closely with academia, but you do have this as a part of um, thinking through process before you come up with different policy or, um, ideas. Um, in our region of Caucasus and Central Asia, um, that's done or tried to be done by Kazakhstan. But if you look at the rest of the region, it's still something new. So I believe that um, the, the COVID-19 showed that um, there is no more place and space for linear thinking. It should be much more anticipatory thinking in the government that always looks at different options, at plausible scenarios. Um, and that helps the government to be prepared. And I can tell you, um, because um, I worked in Singapore, so we would work with foresighting exercises. We would do that for different governments around the world. Uh, global virus pand pandemic was sometimes one of the scenarios as well. So it's been played around by practitioners in foresighting for some time, but it was never actually taken very seriously by the governments. Um, why changes the modus operandi and the way of thinking about the future is important. It's also because that will help the government to become a bit more forward-looking, innovative um, in how they design the policy actions and strategies. And uh, I can tell you that, for example, um, what pandemic showed in Central Asia would be quite interesting. So in, in very much etatist place, a post-Soviet Union, where government is very big and omnipresent and omnipotent, uh, we've seen actually the place for citizen-driven initiatives. For example, when there was a huge problem with healthcare system, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, there was uh, a bottom-up um, initiative groups that would be distributing for people for free oxygen concentrators. Um, that's something that government did not expect to happen, but, but it's happened. And that was helping to fill the gap where hospitals were, were not ready to accept so many patients. Um, another interesting example will be, for example, during a lockdown that nobody expected uh, to have such a tremendous impact on lives of lonely elderly people. And uh, we all, of course, remember stories from Guardian about this. Spain, where many people who were living alone and um, elderly, um, they would be just quietly dying in their beds because nobody was knocking the door asking how they feel. So in Central Asia that experienced this much later than Europe, uh, we actually were able to mobilize and see the big crowds of volunteers that would go during the lockdown, um, preserving every um, quarantine measure, but still they would take care of lonely elderly people in the absence of social workforce, of social um, workers available. Um, that's actually interesting because it shows that at two levels, first of all, the government may want to reconsider the way it's thinking about the future and how it works and how it designs its action plans. But second is there is much more space for active citizenry that could actually be partner of the government in solving um, socioeconomic issues on the ground. And pandemic was making it very, very clear and obvious for everyone. Um, that's my view about um, the governance ch ch challenges at the moment, but then also some opportunities uh, that pandemic provided to the region. Thanks very much. Uh, just, just, just one follow up, you, you, you say that um that governments should be um, looking at foresighting much more in their planning. Um, how do you do that? What, like, you know, if, if I'm if I'm sitting here as a as a as a somebody in a government of a of a country in the region, what 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 would be the concrete 
um, proposal for how I should change the way I'm the way I'm uh, thinking about planning. You can do um, in two ways. Either you have to come up with a very brilliant people that will be part of your think tank, that will be coming to your office, knocking your door and providing you insights. And then you do also different type of foresighting exchanges and exercises, or you basically plunk foresight practitioners in your government uh, institutions. For example, that's what Singapore was doing. They would have a special people working in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Labor that will be meeting quite regularly to talk through um, new developments in the world, the globally, regionally, and come up with the new suggestions and ideas. It's just about um, the way of keeping everybody agile and nimble. So there is no one certain future. It's lots of plausible scenarios, and government is supposed to be ready for all of them. But then they can choose the one that they think would be the most optimal one, and then you know work uh, back forth on um, the action plan to achieve this scenario. So that's about um, going away from rigidness, from top-down conservative approach towards much more lean organizations in the government where you can uh, talk to people, to experts, to um, brains from the outside to think about all possible challenges and how you can be prepared for them. So foresighting is uh, usually, it's, it has very high price tag. It's not cheap option for the policymakers. But so I think we should, we, all be hire, we should all be hiring Aziza then. <laughs> hundreds of Azizas, I think, yeah. <laughs> but that can be done regionally as Are well. Perhaps, regionally, it can be done regionally for several countries to share, but I think that should be, it should be done. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, that my next question to, to Jihad. Um, the the well all countries around the world but also but 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 also in this region are, are, are trying to address the balance between uh spending money to uh to support their economies to provide healthcare um and uh fiscal sustainability uh running up higher debt how do you think uh countries should be approaching that balance um, when is going to be the right moment to, uh, to, to start looking to balancing the books, um, raising taxes perhaps? Um, how much longer can you continue to spend, spend, spend? Um, and, and, and will there be financing available either from the markets or from international institutions like the IMF? Well, uh, this is a, their question currently, in fact. Uh, is how to use uh, your uh, ammunitions for uh, a war that you don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, or let me use another metaphor. Are you running a sprint or are you running a marathon? Um, and it depends also how, uh, how uh, what are your uh, physical uh, level of preparation uh, uh, when you enter this, this marathon? I think those are the two elements that are very important. Um, countries who have uh, entered the crisis with uh, uh, a good level of preparedness in terms of uh, sound macroeconomic uh, uh, frameworks uh, had um, the capacity and still have the capacity to, um, to maneuver better. Uh, if I take the example of uh, uh, Caucasus and Central Asia, countries like Armenia or Georgia have, phys have fiscal buffers. Um, that are in better shape than maybe other uh, oil important countries in, in, in the region. And therefore, they still have the capacity, if they need it, um, to use it. Second is, should you spend uh, across the board? No, I think spending has to be, even if you have the capacity to do it, has to be targeted timely and has to be, has to be uh, a spending that uh, you can, when you need, uh, gradually unwind in order not to create dependencies. Before, even if you have the capacity to spend, you know you, you need to, to know how to spend. In the last uh, couple of weeks uh, during our annual meetings, we had a couple of discussions on that with central bank governors, as well as also with ministers of finance. And I think the, one of the lessons learned from um, the first wave of, uh, of the shock is, is how to, uh, with the level of knowledge that has been accumulated, to be more uh, uh, tactical and targeted in the way you deploy your fiscal. When it comes to the revenue side, I think it's 
Definitely this crisis, uh, especially for middle income countries, emerging economies, showed that um, uh, over the last decade or so, we, uh, uh, maybe the pendulum have shifted a bit in terms of widening inequalities and addressing this issue is the priority going forward. How to do it is by having more progressivity in the tax system, for example, or eliminating some of the re special regimes that we usually build over time. Therefore, while we are still um, addressing the issue of the pandemic, we can um, think of uh, 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 more than one, uh, uh, I would say, type of instrument, which is the expenditure instrument on the fiscal side. What I think is critical is to put any action into a framework. Uh, what is going to bring credibility back is how you anchor your policies into the medium term, even if you need to spend more, or even if your fiscal is going to be used to uh, help you weather this storm, you need to anchor it into the medium term. Um, therefore, credibility in policies is going to be important. Uh, Martin mentioned this on the monetary side, but also applies on, uh, on the fiscal side. Second, uh, uh, there are a certain number of priorities that were identified prior to the crisis, now it's time to implement them. This crisis is about um, um, disruptions and accelerations. There are certain trends that we knew before need to be accelerated. For example, technology. If you have a penny to invest today, you should invest it in technology because technology is going to be important to provide you with the necessary uh, uh, tools for um, uh, e-learning, for distance learning. It is critical for uh, remote working remotely uh, or working uh, in a different form of work organization. Without that, and we are seeing it in some of our countries, the capacity to address and to mitigate the shock has been impaired. Therefore, you need also to be ready for the next generation of, uh, of investment. You have also um, a new form of globalization that is going to emerge the global value chain, the corridors. We're in a part of the world where we are in one of the key corridors from, um, from east to west, from China to Europe. And I think what is important today is to move from a corridor approach to a platform approach, whereby we optimize the way value chains are working. And this would require policies too, would require investment. Therefore, I think we are in a, in a fascinating time in terms of policy making as I said earlier, but also, and this is the difficulty of the, of, uh, of, of the job, is we need to improvise in a situation where the level of uh, um, uh, uncertainty is very high. What is going to be the prospect for oil prices? Many countries in the region are dependent on that. What is going to be the prospect of recovery in the neighboring economies where um, a lot of uh, workers from the region um, um, provide the lifeline to uh, to their family uh, back home. Therefore, those are important issues that require a predictability, credibility, and a planning uh, in terms uh, of, uh, of policies. The last point is um, the monetary policy that has been uh, uh, used by the advanced economies were, was very helpful uh, for emerging countries. It provided uh, low interest rate uh, environment and also liquidity. Uh, it's very important to remain vigilant uh, in order to make sure that the financing requirement for next year for many of the countries are, are assured uh, and also to make sure that the state is not crowding out the private sector too because the state has a better access to market than private uh, companies in a region where still the level of financial inclusion for the private sector, especially the SME, is still very low. This is, I think those are issues that currently many of the people you talk to uh, in decision making uh, are, are part of their, uh, I would say, day-to-day um, -day, um, challenges. And this is where um, the focus of our work is, 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 is to see how in those moments uh, one can limit the scarring, uh, reduce the cost of addressing a challenge like this and be ready and prepared for a fast and strong recovery.
So just to press you a little bit on on what exactly the IMF is doing and, and what you're saying to your to, to, to the countries in your region, um, are you prepared to support and to, to fund um, continued sizable deficits, for example, next year, uh, as long as countries have credible medium term plans? Is that what you're saying? Well, Jack, as you know, the fund has acted very quickly. OK, uh, fund has put immediately, uh, immediately in the same week of the outbreak of the COVID, $100 billion to provide emergency support to countries who needed this. Uh, countries were facing an exogenous shock that affected them. And none, not all of them uh, had the liquidity to address uh, this pandemic. And therefore, the fund has been very quick. In a few weeks, you could uh, mobilize resources. We did it. The first country who received uh, international assistance from the fund was from the region, uh, Kyrgyz Republic, twice. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a fast uh, dispersing. Uh, of course, the conditionalities are, uh, are, are uh, the only con condition is to use this, these resources for their purpose, which is to help protect lives. Uh, but also we provide additional assistance for countries like, for example, in Armenia and Georgia, we, we increase the, um, the size of our program. I think where our role is important uh, going forward, um, in addition to the financing, the grants that we are providing, is in providing, I would say, an integrated approach to, to the problems countries are facing. If it's only about financing, no, this is not where the fund is the most effective. The fund is effective to help you solve a challenge or a crisis or a problem uh, that requires uh, re financing in certain cases, but also requires policy support. And for example, in the region, we have now new uh, capacity development center that is geared toward helping countries in the region strengthen their policy making. And therefore, I think the fund will stay engaged, stay engaged in terms of globally mobilize resources to provide more assistance to developing countries, middle-income countries, emerging economies, uh, pressuring the G20 and other uh, uh, big bilaterals to provide more support, also uh, pushing the private sector to be a strong partner in, in this, in helping countries address that, and make sure that uh, countries have enough to privilege in their spending, protecting the lives of people. This is our role, and this is uh, uh, our mandate. Of course, in certain cases, countries, when they have a very high level of debt and the debt becoming unsustainable, we need to help them address that. And it's better to do it earlier than later. I think what is important today is not to say, OK, now it's time to spend, and tomorrow it's time to adjust. No, we need to have a holistic approach. We need to use all these policies at the same time, and sometimes by having a mix of policies, you could help by addressing your problems at a low cost, but also preserve your, 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 the confidence of market and also confidence of, of citizen in, in your policies. And confidence, I agree with what Martin said, credibility is very important. And Aziza also, uh, in, 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 in the way she was uh, uh, um, describing governance and, and planning and foresighting issues, those are elements that provide confidence to citizens. And I think this is going to be critical uh, for the coming months and year. Thank you. Um, Martin, <clears throat> I'd like to turn to you. Uh, whenever we see um, a, a sharp recession, as we're seeing uh, pretty much everywhere in the world this year, um, the banking sector is a source of concern. Um, and particularly in emerging markets when you have capital outflows, as we have had from many countries. Uh, how much of a concern is the banking sector in Armenia in terms of the medium term, uh, the medium term uh, outlook uh, from the pandemic? And, uh, and what are you doing about it? Thanks, Jack. Um, I think the good thing was that a lot of countries entered the coronavirus pandemic with a robust capital and liquidity buffers and Armenia was not an exception from this. Based on our own experience, I should stress that the role, sound regulatory framework and effective supervision should not be compromised. I would like to stress that again. I did it for uh, monetary policy. I want to double stress it for financial stability one. 
after the 2014 shock in Armenia, we made a tough decision and increased the minimum statutory capital requirement for banks by sixfold. This was a tough but cautious decision to bring our banking sector to, to a new level of sophistication and quality. As we see, it was difficult times that clearly paid off well. More generally, the measures uh, conducted by regulatory authorities of many countries in the micro and macro prudential area have the same goal of enhancing the loss absorption capacity of the financial system while ensuring that it provides financial resources to the economy without any interruption. <clears throat> to achieve this, one of the well-known measures also conducted by the Central Bank of Armenia was the release of different capital buffers accumulated before. So this included mostly the conservation, systemic, and counter-cyclical buffers in our case. However, given the unprecedented size and the scale of the shock and the anticipation of losses on loan portfolios coupled with dividend distribution constraints, the financial system can still be reluctant to use these buffers actively to provide the necessary loans to the economy. And here I think that a clear communication coupled with clear forward guidance of possible regulatory actions are crucial to make these policies effective. In this setup, the role of the policymaker is to decrease the uncertainty and to ensure the resumption of the risk appetite while providing enough liquidity to prevent disorderly adjustments in the financial system. The second important issue is now is how the regulatory authorities are going to phase out or exit the above mentioned measures by starting the process of replenishment of the buffers used before. The regulatory authorities, to my view, should take enough care to design the appropriate time frame for reaching pre-crisis level of capital buffers. That is also very important. And the supervisors should work closely with the banks to understand whether a long time period is needed for buffers accumulation in order to ensure a careful balance between supporting the lending to the economy and preserving financial stability. Having said this, the big question is, what are we going to do with the existing portfolio of loans? The quality of this is very hard to estimate given, given the level of uncertainty. Here I think that the quality of analysis, supervisory portfolio reviews, and sound provisioning cannot be compromised. We should do everything to recognize the true size of the problem and keep the market discipline in place. Otherwise, I believe we will have long-term costs as a result of erosion of discipline and that will quickly become a new normal. To sum up, I think you should never compromise on basically what you believe in. And that would be probably the silver line of what I said. Thanks very much. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna turn again to Aziza. Aziza, um, uh, it's a, this is a region that has a very high level of state involvement in the economy as a rule. Um, Sometimes in the past, uh, in, in, in the course of the COVID crisis, at least in countries in, in the West, um, people have expressed the view that possibly a higher state involvement in the economy would be helpful because it makes it easier to transmit uh, whatever aid mechanisms, either for the economy or, or, for, or for individuals. Um, has that been helpful uh, for countries in, in this region uh, during the course of the COVID crisis to have a high level of state involvement in the economy? And, uh, and do you think now is the moment to push on with, uh, with privatization and with uh, encouraging a greater role for, private, for the private sector? Thank you very much for your question, Jack. Um, I think, first of all, um, again, the crisis um, showed the importance of two things, is inclusion and vulnerability. And when we talk about uh, the region where you have dominance of state-owned enterprises, it's very important to look at the economic inequality. Because economic inequality per se is, is inequality within the economy, irrespective of the actual performance of an economy. You may have very impressive GDP, but it may not trickle down all the way to the people's level. 
and have an impact on the uh, a particular household. So for example, what happens when you have systemic reliance on the state to drive economic growth? So again, during the crisis, you would have bailouts uh, or you have subsidies uh, going to the big SOEs. Um, and in the meantime, growth in the local economy will still remain below the pace um, to adequately generate much needed jobs. That's how we have in the region so many migrants. So Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, um, and yet you still have big SOEs. I would like to speak very concrete figures. Let me talk about Uzbekistan. For example, um, the state-owned enterprises make up 55% of GDP of the country. So here we mean all enterprises with one or the other forms of participation from the state. So because we have a different modality for this. But Altogether, they make up to 55% of the national economy. Um, they pay 47% of countries' tax revenue. Uh, 47, they just to show you how um, not significant maybe a, a SMEs in the eyes of the government, because if you see that half of it just coming from the SOEs, uh, that's a different um, deal breaker. And yet SOEs altogether employ only 6% of formerly employed um, population. So 55% the share of the economy and only 6% of the officially employed people. And that basically uh, explains um, why um, the pandemic was really hard hitting um, population that was not employed by SOEs. And here we have, um, I think, here we come to a very important question. Uh, when privatization will happen on non of non-strategic assets? Because that will mean that it will be less dependence of SOEs on public sector funding. Uh, that could also help finally mitigate market distortion and nurture um, in a perspective the middle class. Um, so I would like to say that it's important to finally uh, move towards um, transparent, um, not opaque, but transparent privatization of the SOEs. But it's also important to transform boards because we still have um, in many countries in the region, very classical supervisory boards, but they should at some point turn into professional boards of directors with disclosures, with um, open recruitments of people, with depolitization from the government and cabinets. Um, so that's in my view uh, should be done sooner um, than later. So to sum up, I would like to say that smaller government is better. Bigger private sector means uh, middle class and more sustainable economic growth in the country. Uh, but it also of course will lead to more uh, transparency in the way profits are being distributed and also um, in the way to measure the impact or the contribution of SEEs to societal goals will be uh, much clearer to people um, on the ground that at the moment may not have this clarity in mind. Thank you very much, Aziza. Um, I'm now going to turn to the questions we're getting from our audience, and I'm happy to say we've got um, quite a lot and quite a good range of questions. Just a reminder, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can ask it uh, on the chat in Zoom, if you're joining us by Zoom, or on social media, hashtag Central Asia or hashtag Caucasus. You can ask in Russian or in English, um, so please keep your questions coming. Um, uh, the first question, I'd like to, to ask Baljan, if he's still, if he's still with us. Uh, I have a question from my colleagues at uh, Bloomberg News uh, in Kazakhstan. Um, we were just talking about uh, state-owned enterprises and privatizations. Uh, the plan uh, for Kazakhstan has been to bring to, 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 to have IPOs of several prominent uh, state companies uh, and for them to be listed on the Astana International Exchange. Uh, how's that been affected by COVID? Um, are you still planning to bring uh, companies to list on the Astana Exchange uh, in the next year? Uh, and 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 what are you doing to try and uh, to try and bring more companies to the, there? Thank you. Indeed, um, we had a plan, and we had the first IPO uh, two years ago. It was Kazakhstan Prom, the national uranium producer, and we had plans to uh, list. Uh, Kazmina Gas, which is the national oil producer this year, and also Astana and Kazakh Telecom were in talks. Obviously, with the COVID, with the pandemic, with the lockdowns, these plans have been postponed because this is not the right time to list a company, especially list a 
Airways company. Uh, but they're still in talks, they're still uh, in plans to list um, at least some of the share of the oil company, the Kazmai Gas, and the Kazakh Telecom, which is telecom provider, which is actually um, one of the few, I don't know, the, the tech companies, especially technology, the telecom companies one of, are sometimes one of the few beneficiaries of the current situation because people rely on internet, people rely on technology, people rely on better connectivity. So there are still plans to list them um, next year. Some of them, um, I think we found a good solution with Samru Casino with the state, uh, state owners, state owned um, sovereign wealth fund to list some of the shares, the main part of the shares on the international exchange, like the London Stock Exchange, because there's better liquidity, there's a better pool of investors, but also list some of the shares on the local stock exchange, because what we've seen, especially when the case was um, Kazakhstan Prom, we have uh, more individual investors interested, uh, active on the local stock exchange, because they're interested in, in the asset, this is the asset they have in their homes. So we have individual investors investing in the local assets, which I think it's a very, very good step. And we had this um, issuances even in the pandemic times. I think one of the um, most recent examples was the IPO of Caspi, Caspi, which started as a bank, but now it's a fintech company. It has very, very successful IPO uh, in, in London. And some of the shares were shared, were also listed in, in Astana, in Nur Sultan, Astana International Exchange. And I think it was quite a success um, given the pandemic, given the current, given the current situation. So the short answer is yes. Uh, the government and AFC are still planning to do these listings, but obviously we were impacted by, by the current situation. I think it's inevitable, it's very understandable that we have postponed it to the next year at least, hope, hope, hoping that um, the station will be at least partially resolved by the time. How much, just, just, just out of curiosity, how much of the Caspi IPO um, was sold on the Estano exchange? Uh, well, I don't have the exact numbers, but it, it, it's a small share compared to the um, equities in, in, in London. I would say something like between um, about 5%, but uh, I have to check, double check the numbers. I don't have the numbers in my head. Right. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, now I, I have a question from, um, from Radio Free Europe's uh, Kyrgyz service. Um, the question is uh, to Jihad. Um, so um, we've seen the pandemic already dramatically affecting Kyrgyzstan and the Kyrgyz economy. Um, what's your evaluation of the current state of the Kyrgyz economy and its outlook? Um, particularly, I would say, given the given given the recent political events. Um, what's the IMF's recommendation uh, for, for how the Kyrgyz authorities should, uh, for what the Kyrgyz authorities should do now? Um, and and this, this is my addition to the question. Uh, are, you, uh, are you currently in talks with the Kyrgyz government to provide additional uh, financial support? Thank you, Jack. Uh, well, Kyrgyz economy has been more affected than other economies because of its nature. It's an open economy dependent on trade as well as also on remittances. And the drop in economic activity uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan as well as also uh, in the neighboring countries have, uh, uh, has affected the economic outlook. We project that growth this year will be negative 12%, the uh, highest drop in economic growth in the region, of course. Uh, this issue of dropping in, 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 in growth uh, has uh, also uh, eroded um, uh, uh, the overall economic stability. And the fund has been very active uh, since the beginning. We have provided the first uh, rapid facility uh, worldwide to, to, to Kyrgyz, and then we augmented it uh, to reach 100% uh, of their quota. And we remain in, uh, in close contact and dialogue with the authorities. In the last few weeks, we had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, the authorities during the annual meetings and to continue the discussion. The inv involvement of the fund in Kyrgyz also had mobilized uh, support from other uh, multilateral institutions and regional institutions. And I think this is also an important element in our role. Uh, it had the Kyrgyz Republic to uh, mobilize uh, funding from uh, 
the World Bank, EBRD, ADB, and other institutions. Um, we will uh, maintain our uh, support and dialogue to the, uh, with the authorities. And, um, you know, we will discuss the modalities uh, now that we have new new government uh, in terms of what are their plans and uh, what are their needs. Thanks very much. Uh, and now I have a question for, for Martin. Um, how has the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan impacted uh, Armenia's financial stability? Uh, thanks. Uh, at this stage, uh, I think we're, v we're not very much affected. And here I would like to, to thank the Armenian public because throughout this year, while trying to build the trust between our institution and general public, I think we succeeded. If you take the previous crisis, uh, even at the lower pace or at the lower scale, mm. we saw several developments, negative ones, which we did not witness during this time. So we are coupled with, with uh, military conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, but I would say that at this stage, we're not very much affected. Armenian financial system is solid and sound and inflation is very much under control. That would be the short answer. Great, thank you. Short answers are wonderful. Uh, I, Jihad, I'd just like to ask you on, on, on the same subject. The IMF has said, um, uh, has called for a ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh, like, like many other uh, organizations, uh, I believe. Um, the IMF is obviously also an important partner of Armenia. Uh, is, are you... Um, uh, able to exert any leverage in order to bring about a ceasefire? Um, and would you disperse further funds to Armenia um, while the, the war is ongoing? Well, uh, Jack, on the first one, I think the answer should come from the UN Security Council. Um, we, as an IMF, we are more in financial economic uh, 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 issues. Uh, on the second question, yes, our relationship with Armenia is uh, is is is, uh, is active and strong. Um, we are uh, finalizing the review uh, uh, of uh, um, the program that we have uh, with the Armenian authorities. Um, of course, we had to adjust in order to take into consideration the recent developments. But I would say, uh, both in terms of uh, our engagement in terms of our dialogue with the authorities, in terms of our support to their economic plan, um, things are, um, are well in place. Um, the level of cooperation is strong. Um, uh, the level of support is, 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 is there, and we look forward to continuous dialogue with the Armenian authorities in order to help them in their reform agenda. Armenia has been able over the last years uh, to do certain important reforms that allowed um, uh, the country to uh, increase the level of uh, buffers uh, uh, with the capacity now, with uh, the level of fiscal space they have to withstand uh, some of the shocks and also on the monetary side, strengthen the, uh, uh, the situation in the financial sector as well as also in the in credibility in the monetary policy. Um. And our next question uh, is on Uzbekistan um, from Davron Jumayev of Uzbek Report. Uh, Aziza, I might ask it to you, um, although maybe Jihad will want to, to, to jump in as well at some point. Um, uh, we heard from Jihad at the very beginning of this conversation that uh, Uzbekistan is one of the few countries in the region expected to see positive growth uh, this year. Um, why do you think that is? What has Uzbekistan done differently? What has Uzbekistan done right? Uh, in my view, it's better if Jahan would um, respond to this question. Would you agree? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Jihad, over to you. What, 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 why is Uzbekistan one of the few countries in the region and, and probably the world that's seeing an, a positive economic uh, growth forecast this year? Well, uh, Uzbekistan has uh, uh, introduced important reforms over the last uh, three, four years that helped the economy uh, navigate the transition uh, into a more market economy, open economy, in a smooth way. Those reforms uh, were instrumental in 
opening uh, the uh, Uzbek economy uh, to attract additional investment, additional investment in various sectors. Of course, the, 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 the nature of the Uzbek economy being uh, more diverse, uh, relying in terms of natural resources on some commodities that were not affected, like gold, and maybe because they came later in terms of opening up, uh, they were not affected by the negative side of the shock, while uh, the reforms have helped them to strengthen their, their buffers and uh, to um, uh, help them amortize uh, 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 these shocks. Still, I think it's important for Uzbekistan going forward to pursue on what they have already initiated uh, to make uh, the economy more competitive, and this would require the acceleration of what has already been initiated in terms of reforming SOEs. I think this would provide additional potential for growth and job creation and would be an excellent way to attract investment. Increase uh, uh, the, uh, the investment in fast-growing sector, and I think uh, technology will play an important role. So in a country that has um, vibrant uh, 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 and uh, strong labor force uh, that uh, can be uh, uh, can play an important role in upgrading uh, the overall economic uh, and uh, an industrial uh, platform uh, uh, that Uzbekistan can provide, and also uh, the uh, strengthening of the links between Uzbekistan and other neighboring countries proved to be very important. Uh, when Uzbekistan started to open up, we saw a, a rapid acceleration of trade with neighboring countries. And I think this trend will help gradually create an economic zone in Central Asia and Caucasus that would be more and more considered in the international economic uh, map, one of the important stones to invest in. Uh, um, Building on the corridors that exist between China, Russia, Middle East, and Europe, building on uh, an internal economic integration among uh, Caucasus and Central Asian countries is one of the steps that could lead um, for a faster recovery and also create an interesting uh, uh, economic zone that would attract uh, uh, investors and would become more and more credible. Uh, as uh, uh, as uh, as an economic uh, platform. If you allow me, I would like to, I just would like to add maybe a, a Please, couple of words. Um, I think Uzbekistan was um, doing relatively well also because the country has been focusing on production. And if you look at the economic um, outlook report produced by IMF, IMF it says that um, the biggest uh, hit was experienced by service sectors. So Uzbekistan was in that sense. In a, in a bit different position from the rest of the region because there was always this uh, very specific uh, focus on production. And in a way, Uzbekistan was trying to imitate um, South Korean chibols, so like picking the winners in all industries and sectors, trying to nurture one, two, three biggest companies. But it also can be double-edged sword because right now what we have, we have very big um, companies that are being picked as a winner, they are being um, facilitated in terms of um, additional financing um, or expert promotion by the government. But now we may want to work a bit more rigorously on the competition policy to actually get away from picking the winners and rather creating um, a level play field for SMEs. And here it's important to work on the regulatory quality that will enable competition being part of the any regulation that is being brought on the market and that can potentially affect SMEs. So I would say that, uh, in my view, production is, was very critical in ensuring the, the growth. But then to stay competitive is important to really move on competition as a priority for the government. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, from Georgia, on Georgia, and I think also from Georgia, um, which I think are probably uh, directed to Jihad. Um, first of all, from Forbes, Georgia, uh, on the deficit, the government deficit in, 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 in Georgia, do you see any pressure that taxes might need to increase in Georgia in the future uh, to, uh, to try and close the deficit? And a second question uh, from Formula TV, Georgia, um, 
so the IMF has forecasts of a 5% contraction for Jordan GDP this year and a 5% growth next year. Uh, what circumstances would lead you to change these forecasts? Well, um, of course, Georgia economy is uh, is an open economy integrated uh, in the region as, a, as well as also with Europe. And therefore, it's normal for a country that uh, uh, tourism sector uh, constitute uh, almost 10% of GDP and it's an open uh, uh, economic platform to be affected by the crisis. And we have revised downward our projections in terms of growth to minus 5% with the capacity to rebound, uh, rebound next year. Uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, with a, expect the growth to be also post to 5% in terms of budget deficit. Uh, the deficit has been revised downward and we expect this year that Georgia may face a deficit, will face a deficit of uh, minus seven uh, and a half percent uh, of GDP. But I would say also here, um, uh, it's clear that uh, reforms have paid and uh, the reforms that were introduced by Georgia over the last uh, decade uh, or so, uh, and the fund has been very active with Georgia, as you know, in helping them with the program, but also with uh, uh, accelerating some of the reforms, uh, has built buffers and the capacity of the economy to adjust uh, uh, has proved uh, uh, its effectiveness. And I would also add that uh, on the monetary side and on the exchange rate policy, also the uh, capacity that has been built within the central bank allowed Georgia to reduce the impact of this exogenous shock uh, uh, on the economy and to preserve and protect the capacity of the private sector. But I think, uh, in Georgia, like in other countries, there are some issues to be addressed, which is the scarring that affects some of the important sectors. And this would require some um, uh, special attention, especially in order uh, not to um, uh, create a long-term negative impact, but also make sure that we have a good utilization of resources by reskilling labor, by uh, making sure that uh, we reallocate resources both human resources and financial resources in order to help in, in the recovery. As you know, Georgia will have elections this weekend and going forward, uh, also we look forward uh, between the fund and Georgia to have a, uh, an active and a fruitful relationship. Thank you. Um, and probably uh, our last question, I think, um, and maybe this is one for Aziza, although uh, if anyone else wants to answer it, then then uh, feel free. Uh, I think probably any of you could have, could answer this question. Maybe, maybe you all want to. Uh, Nadim Nakbi asks, um, governments in Central Asian countries uh, seem to be less responsive to the changing needs of their citizens than, than countries in Europe. Um, do you think that's correct? And uh, how, do you, how do you think they should change? Um, I think in general, we have to remember always about the context and the context of the region of the Soviet uh, of the post Soviet region, the Central Asian Caucasus has been very much about etatism. That's in the past where government was everything. The government was in the entire economy, the government was in the public life, government was in a driving seat for everything. So in a way to change this paradigm and to move to this society where government is a bit more, you know, responsive to the needs, and yet actually it creates a space for civil society for again, active citizenry may take time. But I'm happy to see that again, the, the crisis, uh, I think triggered governments to turn to people in many cases, just because it was very difficult to deliver services on the ground because the government was dealing with uncertainty, with a new um, challenges, with the pressing needs, with the need to be, again, nimble and agile that is never learned how to become. So in a way, that's where people would stand up and do the job for the government. And actually it worked very well. In many parts of the region, we hear a story of government um, not able to uh, outreach in the further regions of the countries. And that's where people as a volunteers would do the job. So in my view, um, the glass of, glass is half full 
while I say that Central Asia, to my surprise, unlike um, Asian countries, is much more conservative in terms of relationships between government and its people. But I still believe that there is positive trend where government turns more and more and more to people for help, for cooperation, for partnership. And it may grow into very beautiful new power relations between state and its people. Excellent, excellent note. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give uh, each of you, each of each of our panelists, uh, just an opportunity now to to wrap up any conclusions they'd like to mention from the from the panel. And given, uh, I think Aziza has started us off on an excellent note. I was going to say, uh, you know, given the, the, given these challenging and sometimes rather depressing times, uh, perhaps you can uh, give us. A reason to be hopeful uh, for the for coming from from the Central Asia Caucasus region. Um, uh, Barajan, perhaps we can start with you if you're still here. Uh, well, I am here indeed, and um, I, 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 Aziza's comments were very, very optimistic as well, because she talks about how the government and people should work together. I think that's something I was mentioning that we need to move further, we need to create new institutions, we need to create new ways to, to move forward because, I mean, coming back from the, and you know, looking at the context, what happened in the 90s and then what happened in the early 2000s, there are different stages of development in, in different countries. So I think um, the pandemic actually forced us to make another step. We're still different level, I guess, in our countries, countries in the West, um, even within our countries, in, within our regions, we have different levels of uh, development institutions. But I think this is the right time to do the right reforms. I think that's what we started to do with the, in the new agency in the Supreme Council. And we just need to make a new step and moving from old policies, old institutions, old ways of doing business, because it's not only pandemic. And I think what uh, it was the quote from, um, uh, was it from Andrew Rubinstein, he said that the, the, actually the pandemic didn't create any new agenda, it just accelerated all the things that have been um, here already. It just accelerated the move to the new, um, the fourth industrial revolution, accelerated to the move to the uh, new social contract between the government and the, and the society. So I think that um, we have to rethink the ways and there is a long way to go. But I'm happy that we're doing this, we're discussing here um, online this very important issues. And then there are, the whole week was uh, different discussions, different panels. And I think uh, what we actually happened to do more, actually talk to each other. You know, um, before we had to go convene to specific forums, to specific um, conferences. Now we have this ongoing discussions every week. Almost every day, there's something happening. So I think this is a very, very positive step. And I think there's a, even though there's a long way to go to a perfect state, or maybe we'll never achieve the perfect state, there's a we see a lot of good changes. So hopefully, um, they will help us to recover from the current crisis and you know step into a brighter future. I, I want to remain positive. I do remain positive. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, any any concluding thoughts? Um, I'll be a bit philosophical now. So if you look at, at the history back in decades, you, you would see that the economic cycles or the economy in general in the world was followed uh, or presented by a long periods of prosperity interrupted by very short periods of shocks or severe shocks. Currently, what we are living through, and I think uh, we see the paradigm shift in that sense, we'll be living through crisis with very short periods of prosperity. And what that means for any kind of institution or a country in general, it means that we need to learn. And by learning, I don't merely mean only education or science, but I mean that we should all become a learning institution in a way. That's what we're trying to do in the Central Bank of Armenia. And we're not trying to concentrate on a very specific question or a problem, but we're trying to create an environment where ideas could flow freely, where we could challenge and come with unprecedented thoughts and everything should be discussed and taken into account. That is my approach to 
to the further life that we'll be living through. In terms of um, short-term things that we need to do to come out from this crisis in a victorious way, I think several things are Are very, keep your promises. Second, and very important again, is the way how you communicate with your public. Because um, many times, this sincere and frank communication can make miracles that we personally didn't believe in, in this country, but which happened. So I think uh, this was a very good lesson, and this still is a good lesson to learn from. And that would be just very unfortunate to waste this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Aziza, uh, very briefly, do you have any concluding thoughts? No, again, just trying to the new institutions that will be amongst this debacle of old institutions because of COVID, because of other things. People want to see uh, a bit more inclusion and much more cohesion in the society. So in that sense, um, again, any crisis, like Chinese would say, the crisis and uh, changes, it usually would have the same um, letter, right? So I would say that this challenge provides new opportunities for new changes. And if we work on that well, and we can really make it um, efficient, we may end up as a region with a bit more um, diversity, with a bit, with a bit more inclusion, but and also that's much more hope for a better future. Excellent. And finally, Jihad, uh, it's your panel. Uh, what would you like to give us your concluding thoughts? Thank you, Jack. Well, I'm happy to see that we are ending on this high note, um, and we're elevating the debate to um, um, to where I think uh, the situation is. We are. Definitely, as, as we saw in this discussion, we are at one of the, those crossroads that are important for the humanity and important for our, our countries. And therefore, leadership is a high level of uncertainty, but still you do them. Uh, and you don't uh, uh, shy away from... Uh, uh, from you know, moving uh, and taking actions when uh, things are uh, uh, are very challenging. I think what I would hope for is one that uh, humanity will come stronger after that, and therefore uh, that uh, the vaccine uh, and the vaccine uh, um, utilization will be done and shared in a, in a very positive way that will bring the humanity together and also will strengthen international cooperation. I think this is going to be an important element to allow uh, uh, the international community and our uh, countries to come up stronger out of this crisis. And I'm very much satisfied from what we saw over the last six, seven months, whereby at least on economic and financial front, we saw uh, coming together the G20 initiative and other initiatives that were taken uh, in order to help uh, uh, countries address this challenge. This is one. Second, I think in any crisis, um, you have an opportunity that comes with it. And in this crisis, we have certain number of silver linings that emerged already. Technology is one, investing in the youth and their capacity and improving inclusion of women and youth uh, as a way for uh, uh, Caucasus and Central Asian countries to lift up economy is uh, a very good investment in the future. But also, I think um, there is another dimension that we did not uh, maybe focus on enough, is investing in, in making our life better, uh, investing in greening the recovery, investing in making sure that our planet is, 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 is being taken care of is also an important element. Last is um, confidence at, at the heart of everything. And uh, confidence is an it's something that you can lose very quickly and building it takes a lot of time. 
And leadership here also plays an important role in, in, uh, in bringing confidence back. And without confidence, you cannot uh, address the challenges. And confidence can be strengthened by improving the level of governance, improving the level of participation of citizens, build new social contract that is more inclusive and more participatory. And for that, we at the fund, we are focusing on those priorities. We are focusing on the priority of how we make social at the heart of the recovery. And we have a paper that has been issued a few weeks ago that we will discuss further in the coming weeks that will focus on that. Improving governance for the benefit of citizen is also very important. Uh, aligning resources to the, also the benefit of the inclusion and creating opportunities, this is also something that we focus on. But also helping managing crises because we will face situations where the high level of debt or imbalances would require uh, someone. But doing it in the proper way, proactively and with all the stakeholders is the best way to get stronger out of, uh, of the crisis. Therefore, those are fascinating moments. And I think this discussion that we had today, and I would like to thank the participants uh, for this um, great uh, discussion we had and uh, questions were uh, superb in terms of, uh, uh, of their quality. Thank you, Jack, uh, for being with us. And thank also uh, AIFC for being our partner. Uh, um, and again, uh, stay safe. Make sure that you are, take care of, uh, of the people who are around you. And uh, you know, we need to keep working in order to address the challenges that we have ahead of, of us. Uh, back to you, Jack. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, well, that's it. Thanks, thanks very much to all of our panelists for joining us. And thanks to you for watching and for your questions. Um, I'm, I hope we've left, uh, left, left it on some note of optimism uh, despite these challenging times. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, you can disconnect. Bye bye.